Before we look at our case study relating to cirrhosis, I'd like to remind you of the many different potential outcomes of liver failure. Starting with glucose, we know that the liver is responsible for not only making new glucose in what we call gluconeogenesis, but also storing excess glucose as glycogen so that when our blood glucose levels need to be balanced, that glycogen can be broken down into glucose and put into the blood, returning the body to homeostasis. And so if we don't have this ability to produce new glucose and, and break down glycogen into glucose, it can lead to hypoglycemic events. Protein production is also affected when the liver fails. And we know that big protein is albumin. And so if albumin is not produced and it's in lower quantities than normal in the blood, it's called hypoalbuminemia. And we know that when we have less protein in the blood, which acts, this albumin acts to keep fluid within our vessels, then fluid leaves, leading to states of edema, especially seen in the lower extremities and ascites in the abdomen. In addition, we know that the liver is responsible for producing certain factors that contribute to the coagulation cascade or the clotting, clotting cascade, and that means that a person is more likely to bleed. The liver is also responsible for producing cholesterol, and cholesterol is a very important building block for our bodies. For example, it's a major component of all cell membranes, and it's also used to make many essential molecules such as hormones and fat-soluble vitamins and bile acids, that sort of thing. So if we have a reduction in the production of cholesterol, it's going to have an effect on the production of many other substances and really the integrity of cells in our body. The liver we know produces bile, so it produces these bile salts that are going to be released as part of a, a solution really into the duodenum where we will be able to properly break down and, and absorb fat. Not only the fat in our food, but also proper processing of fat soluble vitamins, which include vitamin A, D, E, and K. So if we're not actually absorbing fat and breaking it down properly, then it's just going to pass through the rest of our digestive system, passing right through to become part of our stool, which can lead to fatty stools. And these are going to be, this is gonna be evident where the fat is actually, the, the stools are actually floating. And that is called steatorrhea. Now looking at a few other problems that occur when the liver fails. When proteins in our body are broken down into amino acids, they're going to, this whole process of protein metabolism is going to produce ammonia. And ammonia is very toxic to the body, but that's okay because a healthy liver can take that ammonia and convert it to urea and our body has great ways of excreting urea. But if the liver is failing to properly convert ammonia to urea, and yet we're still producing ammonia from constant protein metabolism, then the ammonia will build up within the blood and it can be very toxic to tissues in our body, including the brain, and it can lead to encephalopathy. Signs and symptoms of encephalopathy could include lethargy, so extreme fatigue, dementia. It can even lead to cases of seizures and, and tremors and muscle twitching, and in severe cases can lead to a coma. Another role of the liver is to metabolize steroid hormones. And if, a, if the liver is failing and not able to metabolize these steroid hormones, then there'll be an increased amount of them within the, within the blood. And this includes aldosterone, which is a steroid hormone. And we know that what aldosterone does normally is it stimulates the kidneys really at the level of the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct uh, to reabsorb for the blood, to reabsorb more sodium and subsequently more water. So if we're putting more sodium and water into our blood, we know that that's going to increase blood volume. But the problem with that in the case of liver failure where those proteins albumin are not being produced is that all of that water essentially that we take back is not able to stay within the blood vessels because there isn't a strong enough oncotic pressure within the vessels. So it seeps out and that's just going to increase edema and increase ascites. 
Steroid hormones that are also metabolized by the liver include androgens such as testosterone and estrogens in both males and females for both of these hormones. And so if we're not breaking them down, then the levels can increase above what is considered normal. And this can lead to exaggeration of features in males and females, including gynecomastia in males where the breasts actually develop. So it's not just fatty tissue at the level of the chest, it's actual breast tissue that increases in size and the testicles can atrophy and menstrual irregularities in females with these higher levels of estrogens. Uh, this is also common. And we'll see later in the case study that when there is an increased level of estrogen in the body, it can lead to spider angiomas but we'll come back to that. The liver is also responsible for metabolizing drugs. So the drugs that are taken in, whether they're um, recreational or pharmaceutical, whatever drugs are being taken into the body, the liver can detoxify them and make them less toxic to your body. And so if this doesn't happen, if they're not properly detoxified, then it will build up in the body and have detrimental effects on many organs within the body. And then finally, bilirubin, which we've talked about a lot. If the liver cannot properly uh, process and or excrete the bilirubin, it can lead to a bili build up a bilirubin in the blood, which can lead to hyper which is called hyperbilirubinemia, which we know can lead to jaundice. So now reviewing all of this information and many of the, the effects of liver failure, this should help you in understanding the case study coming up next. We'll look now at a case study that focuses on the condition of cirrhosis. The initial history is a 59 year old male. He's brought into the emergency department with hematemesis during the last two days. Remember that hematemesis is the vomiting of blood. Now, if that blood has been digested in any way, then it will oftentimes take on a coffee ground appearance. But if it's fresh red blood, it's because it's a fresh bleed and it, it could be more of an upper bleed that might not have been exposed to digestive enzymes. And we talked about esophageal varices as an example of blood vessels that if they become dilated in this condition of esophageal varices, these veins can dilate so much that they can rupture. And if they're rupturing and vomited up, then it will have a brighter red blood appearance. And so here's a diagram to remind you of esophageal varices that can happen with portal hypertension, which we know can occur with cirrhosis. Additional history showed no recent infections, no fever, no recent falls. So we're trying to rule out any other possible conditions or problems that this person might have. He reports drinking eight to 12 beers per day and more on the weekend for approximately 25 years. He had his last beer two days ago. Smoking 20 pack per year history. This could mean for an example that he smoked 20 cigarettes per day for 20 years, but you can look up online what a pack year is. We've, we've spoken about this in the past. He's had a beer belly for about 10 years that's getting bigger over the past month and now it's starting to get quite tender over the last three to four days. And so we know that that beer belly we associate with the condition of ascites. And he's had confusion over the past three to four days. So this tells us possibly that maybe there's some neurological component that's impacting his brain's ability to, to properly function. And he's had dark stools all week. And the dark stools are likely because of the presence of blood in the stool. And we know the blood that's been digested is called melina and blood that is fresh is called hematochezia. So fresh, bright red blood, hematochezia, and melina for that, that darker blood that you can sometimes see because the stools are darker, but because it gives off this dark, this dark, uh, very tarry, foul smelling appearance but sometimes the blood is not as easy to see in the stool depending on how much was present. Okay, physical examination showed that his temperature, body temperature is normal, so indicating no infection. 
and that was done orally. A pulse rate is high, uh, but regular. Respiratory rate is a little bit high and slightly labored, so he's experiencing some dyspnea. And his blood pressure is a little bit on the higher end as well, especially his systolic. Slight scleral icteris, so yellowing of the sclera is present. And when we talked about the cause of jaundice being really hyperbilirubinemia, so an increase in the amount of bilirubin present in the blood. And if that bilirubin cannot be proper, properly metabolized and then excreted by initially the liver, then it can stay in the blood and it can deposit itself into into tissues and the sclera of the eye has a lot of elastin within it which has a very high affinity for bilirubin and it's so it's one of the first places that jaundice will be evident so looking at the eyes but other mucous membranes and the skin is also important as well and he has mild jaundice in in the skin he also has the presence of spider angiomas over his upper chest and abdomen. And I have a picture here of what a spider angioma is. And it it's it gets named spider because it looks like a, a spider, an angio or angies referring to blood vessels. Spider angiomas are dilations of these pre-existing arterioles, and they give that spidery appearance. And one of the thoughts as to why they form is because of increased presence of estrogen within the blood and we spoke about during the end of our our last class about how how estrogen levels can increase because if the liver is not metabolizing these hormones it can lead to the presence of an increase in estrogen which can lead to spider angiomas so we can say then a sex hormone imbalance because of improper metabolism of hormones is a cause of the spider angiomas. Several bruises on his lower extremities. This would be because of a reduction in the amount of clotting factors that are present within the body. And so if we're missing clotting, components of our clotting cascades, then a person is more likely to bruise, but of course all also more likely to bleed. It's also possible thinking back to when we talked about splenomegaly and how we have blood cells within our spleen. If the spleen gets very congested as it can with portal hypertension, then some of those those thrombocytes or those platelets that are normally able to be released from the spleen when we need them get trapped there along with red blood cells and white blood cells as discussed during the in-class lecture. He has a rapid shallow breathing pattern, which can mean that there are some concerns with pulmonary function. And we talked about the relationship between a, a failing liver or portal hypertension and pulmonary problems. A large and distended abdomen, which we know is ascites. He has a positive fluid wave. A fluid wave test is sometimes called a fluid thrill test, and this is a test for ascites where they're looking for or trying to feel this free fluid that's present within the abdomen. And it's performed by having a patient, if you can picture them, a patient lying on their back, and you can have the patient push their hands or the, the knife edge of their hand down on the midline of their abdomen, and then the examiner can tap one flank and have the other hand on the other flank and when they tap one flank that fluid can travel to the other side and be felt by the other hand. It's also difficult to determine the border of his liver. So lots of lots of fluid build up within the abdomen and two plus edema of both feet. So we've talked about edema in patho before. This here is just showing you the different degrees of edema. And remember, it, this would be uh, pitting edema where we have the imprint that's left behind. And so being able to press down four millimeters is considered two plus edema. And hemorrhoids, that gets us back to the venous congestion from portal hypertension as discussed during the in-class lecture, but no visible bleeding at this time. 
Now looking at diagnostic tests, we can see hypoxemia or low low oxygen within the blood and low oxygen saturation, which is related to pulmonary problems. And we talked about how the liver in cases of cirrhosis can cause pulmonary problems as well. Blood pH though is still normal. Blood is present in his stools. We spoke about melina. And so he's some internal bleeding from probable varices that have ruptured. Low hemoglobin and hematocrit. Hemoglobin and hematocrit tests can, sh these can come up very low if you have internal bleeding. And we know that he does have internal bleeding relating to those ruptured varices. But also if the spleen is congested and we have splenomegaly, we know that additional red blood cells that would normally be stored there are congested and might not be able to get out. And then with thrombocytopenia, that can be the same situation where the additional thrombocytes or platelets that will be found in the spleen are trapped with this, this splenous congestion and unable to get out to do their, do their job when it's needed. It's really a, a splenic sequestration where those cells get trapped in that congested spleen. His diagnostic tests also showed increased direct bilirubin. Remember that direct bilirubin is the same thing as conjugated bilirubin. And to remind you of our bilirubin metabolism, we had said that once on unconjugated bilirubin from the breakdown of red blood cells enters the liver, it will bind with or form a relationship with glucuronic acid in the liver. And when this happens, it becomes conjugated bilirubin. And conjugate, I said, is bring together. So it's these two are being brought together and now it's conjugated. And this makes the, con the bilirubin water soluble. And so it will leave the liver then, a normal healthy liver, and it will travel to through bile channels to the gallbladder where it will reside with bile. And when the gallbladder squeezes to get rid of the bile that's within it to put some of it into the small intestine for fat digestion, the the bilirubin, that conjugated bilirubin, will move with it into the duodenum. And then over time, we will see that this, this conjugated bilirubin will either end up in the stool as part of the stool or end up in the urine. Now let's say we have a case of cirrhosis, as we do here, and the liver does some conjugation of the bilirubin, so forms some conjugated bilirubin, and then that bilirubin that's conjugated is trying to get out of the, the liver, travel through those bile channels to get to the gallbladder, but it can't. It's like a roadblock's been set up because the liver is, is so full of scar tissue. And so what happens is because it all can't get out, it spills into the blood. And when it spills into the blood, this conjugated bilirubin, it travels actually quite nicely in the blood because it's water soluble, but you can see why we would have this increase in direct bilirubin or conjugated bilirubin within the blood. So this is hyperbilirubinemia then. Now, we also spoke about during the in-class lecture that the unconjugated bilirubin, that, unsol that, that unsoluble, or I should say that lipid-soluble bilirubin, that if it is in high quantities within the blood and it cannot be properly transferred by albumin to the liver to be conjugated, then it builds up as well in the blood, but it's the unconjugated kind that can't travel well within the blood because it's lipid soluble. And so it tends to spill into the tissues, such as the sclera of the eyes, mucous membranes, and the skin leading to jaundice. Now moving on to another diagnostic test result being elevated transaminases. We had, we had introduced these earlier, but these are the different liver enzymes that exist that when the liver is damaged, it can release these enzymes that spill into the blood that can be detected on diagnostic tests and indicate if they're present that there might be liver damage. 
long prothrombin time. This is a test that's done to see how long it takes for the blood to clot. And this again goes back to the fact that there's going to be a reduction in clotting cells that are available to form a clot because they're trapped in the spleen but also because the liver we know produces very important factors that are involved in clotting. And if the liver's damaged and can't properly produce those factors, then that also contributes to that long prothrombin time. Elevated serum ammonia. We know already that the liver will take ammonia, which is a byproduct of protein metabolism, and convert it to urea, which is really a less toxic form, and then our body knows how to get rid of urea quite nicely. But if the liver cannot properly break down this ammonia into urea, then the ammonia builds up. It will not be processed by the liver. It will remain within the blood, and this can actually travel the ammonia that is to tissues and have a negative effect including the brain where it can cause what we called hepatic encephalopathy earlier. Low albumin, we are aware that the liver produces albumin that that solute, that protein that remains within our blood vessels that acts as an oncotic forms this oncotic pressure to keep fluid within our vessels. We know that the liver produces it, and if it's damaged, then there'll be less albumin available within the blood, which means we have a tougher time keeping our fluid within our blood vessels, and so it spills out into the interstitial spaces and into the peritoneum, leading to what we talked about as edema, as well as that specific form of ascites. The liver is also responsible for producing cholesterol. And this is important because the we're not talking about the cholesterol from food where, that can build up in the, in the blood and have negative effects. I'm talking about the cholesterol that makes up the cell, many of the, all of our cell membranes and gives it its structural integrity among other, among other roles. And finally, the ECG or electrocardiogram showed sinus tachycardia, which is where this is a sinus rhythm with an elevated rate of impulses. So we have greater than 100 beats per minute of the heart. That, so that would be considered tachycardic. And the normal would be anywhere between, say, 60 and 100. And this is likely a compensatory mechanism that exists as so many of the normal body processes are failing to do what they need to do. That is the end of today's lecture. Thank you so much for listening.